Take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to John chapter 3, the Gospel of John, the third chapter, one of the most familiar chapters in all of the Bible. Questions? Do you have any? Have you had any? It's not unusual for us to have questions about our faith. In fact, I would say it's okay to be filled with questions when you come to the things of God. But you have to remember, when you have questions about your faith, you should first ask, well, what would Jesus say? How would Jesus respond to these things I'm thinking about in my life? I would tell you this, he's not intimidated by your questions, but he does have answers. Before we get started, I have a question for you. Of all the words in the Bible, which words are the words of God? What do you think? It's all of them, right? In fact, we believe all of the Bible is inspired by God. When you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God or woman may be complete and equipped for every good work. So we understand that the Bible we have today uh, comes from those original manuscripts in Hebrew and Greek. And in fact, just in case you're wondering, uh, there's more archaeological and historical evidence of the authentication of those manuscripts in the Hebrew and Greek than there are of the writings of William Shakespeare. So we believe that those words were divinely inspired. They were God-breathed into the authors who wrote those. So we can trust the Bible, right? Now, my college professor didn't believe that, and he was a religion professor. In fact, he would say things like the first 11 chapters of Genesis, those are just myth, because surely God didn't create everything. And, you know, Moses didn't cross a, a Red Sea, because people can't do that. And certainly Jonah was not swallowed by a... Oh, well, did, did anybody see the news this week? The lobster fisherman off of Cape Cod, he said everything was dark, <laughs> and I realized I was in the belly of a well. I'm just trying to tell you, you can trust God's Word. So all of the Bible is God's Word, but many of you, when you open the Scriptures and you get to the New Testament, you'll notice some of the words are written in red. What do those red words mean? Those are the words of Jesus. So we believe that eyewitnesses wrote down the words that literally came off of the lips of Jesus. They must be pretty important, right? God in flesh speaking into our lives. And so for the next several weeks throughout the summer, we're going to look at those red hot words. Some of the most well-known words in the Bible. And today, we begin with what I think is the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3.16. Some of you memorized it as a child, like I did, in the old King James. If you know it, I want you to say it. If you don't know it, don't be embarrassed. Just say, watermelon, 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 while we're talking, okay? So if you know it, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. What an amazing verse we've learned there out of God's Word. Some of the most famous verses in Scripture. In fact, I can remember as a child going to baseball games, whether in Atlanta to watch the Braves, or, or one time I literally, because we were on a trip, watched the Braves play against the Los Angeles Dodgers. But even if it was on TV, I could see that guy in the rainbow wig, and he would have a big poster most of the time that said, John 3.16. Or maybe you saw the episode of The Simpsons where they made fun of him. You remember this guy? So the whole world recognizes, man, there's something about those words. There's something about that verse. In fact, I'm starting here because I believe you can't begin to heed any of the other words of Jesus until you first understand and follow these words, John 3.16. So we're going to pray because I believe this moment may be transformational in some of your lives. In fact, I'm praying that some of you walk out of here with a different eternal destination than that with which you walked in. 
you got up and you came to church because that was a good thing to do. But if life were to end today, you would spend eternity separated from God in the place the Bible calls hell. And yet that's not God's desire. So I'm praying that he works and you listen and respond so that that change is made. So let's pray. Father, our prayer is simple today. Speak. Give us ears to hear and, and a heart and mind that's receptive. Lord, give us those things that we need that we don't have. Teach us those things that we need to understand that we don't know. But most of all, Lord, change us, transform us into men and women or boys and girls that we've not yet become. God, just a few moments ago we met and at least two people bravely identified that they needed to be born again. God, would you, would you give courage to some in this moment to do the same? Save somebody today. You're the only one who can. So Lord, give me the words to say and the thoughts to think so that nothing I do or say gets in the way as you speak. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. John chapter 3, and in my Bible, as I look at this chapter, it says, you must be born again. John chapter 3 comes right after John chapter 2, and always in the Bible we should try to understand the context. In John chapter 2, Jesus performs his first miracle. Do you know where that took place? It was at a wedding, and, and kind of it hit me over the last couple of weeks is we celebrated our, our son's marriage, and I had the chance to officiate my son's wedding. That's such a special time. I mean, the Bible begins with a wedding. They're in the Garden of Eden. The Bible ends with a wedding in Revelation. And Jesus' first miracle is at a wedding, and, and I get it now because after I officiated the wedding, which was interesting, by the way, because I was at a very important part of the wedding, and I opened my mouth to say something, and a gnat flew right in and hung out on my vocal cords, and he realized he was going to his death, and so he wouldn't let loose. I couldn't say, I was like, I mean, I couldn't say anything. It was, anyway, it was memorable. But after that, we just began this party. We had a great time. It was so much fun. And Jesus performs this miracle at this wedding, and everybody begins to notice there's something different about this guy. And then he does what anybody who is serious about God should do. He, he goes to a corporate place of worship. He goes to the temple. And so parents, let me just... Let this be our summer reminder. Don't ever expect your kids to prioritize the things they watch you marginalize. So if you're serious about your walk with God, what you're doing in this place is important. I'm so glad that we're able to come back together and worship corporately. So Jesus went to the temple and he did not like what he saw. And in fact, there was all kind of nonsense going on. And it says that Jesus got angry and he began to throw things around. One of the other gospel tells us that Jesus even says, you've made my house a den of thieves when it's supposed to be a house of prayer for all the nations. And I can't help but think that God would look at some of the things that go on inside buildings that are called the church today and it would make him angry. But it's in that context that we find John chapter 3. The next event says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Say Nicodemus. Now say it again like you mean it. Say Nicodemus. Now say your name. I don't just, last service did the same thing. Do you not know your name? You was like, Nicodemus. Say your name. Let's try that again. Say your name. All right, here's what I want you to know. You may not, you may not know your name, but God knows your name. When you see specific people recorded in Scripture, you should be reminded that God knows your name. A friend of mine likes to say, God knows your address. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you need. He, the person sitting next to you may not know what's really going in your life. Your spouse, your family member may not know the secrets of your life, but God knows. He knew Nicodemus, a, a ruler of the Jews. So instantly we see this man's outward identity. And Nicodemus had been living the way a lot of, I li a lot of us live, focused on that outward identity. 
So we're really concerned about what people think about us, and often it's based on the wrong things. It's based on our accomplishments, the job titles, the education. It's based on our bank account, the kind of house we live in, the clothes we wear, or, or the car we drive, uh, the achievements that we have in life. And that creeps its way even into religious settings, and so we walk into the church focus on our outward identity. And so John, the writer of these words of God, it lets us know that Jesus is aware of this. And this man came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, our teacher, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs. What signs? Well, he had just turned water into wine. Don't you think that spread like wildfire? He had just gone into the temple and professed that he was different than the other worshipers. No one can do these signs unless God is with them. And Jesus answered him and said, Truly, truly, I, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of of God. And, and that's when we realize that the one that we're reading about, this man named Nicodemus, the most religious person that perhaps Jesus would meet, does not have what he needs. He needs to be born again. That's when we begin to understand that there's a difference between religion and regeneration. Regeneration is when something new takes place in your life and you're born again. And, and some of you, even as I'm talking about this, you, you need to understand that's where you are. It, exactly where this well-known guy in the Scripture is. You, you need to be born again. You, you want the things of God. You want the blessings of God. You want to be a part of the kingdom of God. But the truth is, you need to be born again. You, you've not experienced that thing which most transforms you. That thing Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 13. You might look at those verses with me. Jesus is telling a parable. A parable is a story that Jesus would tell to illustrate truth. And it says, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. So this is a farming parable. I'm not a farmer, but we did have a little garden as I was growing up around our house. And that was sometimes part of my responsibilities. And sometimes I was the one who planted the seed. Notice what happens. But while his men were sleeping, the other gardeners... His enemy came and he sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. An enemy. I want to remind you today that you have an enemy. It may not be who you think it is because you only have one enemy. The Bible calls him a thief. He comes to steal and kill and destroy. He, de he deceives. He divides. He discourages. So when the plants came up and bore grain... Then the weeds appeared also. Again, I'm not a wheat farmer, but I've, I've heard this described. In a wheat field, the problem of weeds is different than it was in our little vegetable garden in our backyard. We had rows that we had dug and planted different seeds for the tomato plants and the different things that we planted. And I would have to, sometime for allowance, sometime just in order to live in the house that I lived in, I would have to go and pull the weeds out of the garden. That was easy, really. But in a wheat field, the weeds that would come up look just like the wheat. Some of you have heard this story from Jesus, and you heard it called the wheat and the tares. The tares were stalks that looked just like the wheat, but they weren't wheat. In fact, the only way that you could tell that they were not wheat is to tear the stalk open. If you tore the stalk open, if it was wheat, there would be grain inside. If, if it was not wheat, it would be empty inside. Why did Jesus tell that story? He told this story for the same reason that he's talking to Nicodemus. He's saying it's possible to be very religious and not be regenerate. It's possible to be a church member and not be a Christian. It's possible to have all the appearance so that no one around you would think anything. And yet you'd be headed to hell. Because the only way to know the difference is what's going on on the inside. Some of you are thinking, well, everybody knows I'm a Christian. Everybody knows I'm a follower of Christ. And the answer is, no, they don't. They might see some things that look like fruit in your life. But it's only God that knows your soul. Are you an unsaved church member today? Are you an unsaved deacon? An unsaved community group leader? An unsaved vacation Bible school teacher? 
an unsaved youth group member? Are you? Billy Graham, when he preached, nearly every time he preached, either in the message or the invitation, he would say something like this. I believe that the vast majority of church members in this culture are lost. Now, purely from a diagnostic standpoint, that's easy to guess at because you look at all the people who say they're saved that are part of a church, and then you look at the difference we're making in the culture. We're not really a salt and light, right? But someone asked him, Dr. Graham, why is it that you would say such a thing? And he said, because I was an unsaved church member. Maybe you didn't know that about Billy Graham. He was singing in the choir, a youth choir at an evangelistic event in Charlotte, North Carolina. He was vice president of his youth group at the church when the Holy Spirit of God began to draw him to Jesus, when he recognized that he had all the outer trappings. He was religious like Nicodemus, but he, he was not saved. Some of you are weeds. Some of you need to be born again. You've heard of John Wesley. John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist Church. He wrote many of the hymns that we sing. John Wesley came to America as a preacher, and on that trip he saw 30,000 Americans converted in an evangelistic crusade. He got on a ship to head back to England, and some Moravian missionaries were on the same ship. And the he, he says in his biography that as they began to share with him the gospel of Jesus Christ, his heart was strangely warmed. And he realized that even as a preacher of the gospel, he had not been saved. And he counts that as the moment that he was born again. I could just read to you the tombstone of a man buried in England, the man named John Berridge. This is what the tombstone says. Here lie the earthly remains of John Berridge, late vicar of Everton. An itinerant servant of Jesus Christ who loved his master and his work and after running on his errands many years was caught up to wait on him above. Then in words you can't see in the picture it says, Reader, art thou born again? No salvation without a new birth. I was born in sin February 1716, remained ignorant of my fallen state till 1730, lived proudly on faith and works for salvation till 1754, was admitted to Everton Vicarage. In other words, he was a pastor in 1751, but I fled to Jesus alone for salvation, for refuge in 1756. And then I fell asleep in Christ January 22nd, 1793. Are you born again? Are you religious without being regenerate? Are you a church member or a church attender that needs to be saved? Church, I want you to do me a favor and welcome my good friend, Dr. Jim Stock. Would you welcome him as he comes onto the stage right now? Dr. Stock is a distinguished professor at the University of South Florida. He's an active member and a, a leader in our church. But Dr. Stock, you have an interesting story, and it relates to this idea of being born again. So welcome. Um, tell me about your life before you were born again. Well, like perhaps many of you in this room, my parents attended church. They took us with them. Um, and I did that for all of my growing up years uh, through high school and then went away to college. And uh, while at college, I walked down an aisle and uh, was baptized. And so uh, that sounds like a lot of people, you know, nothing. I wasn't uh, a drug dealer. I didn't uh, abuse people. I didn't do any of these things. I was a fairly good person, sort of nondescript. And, uh, thought that was uh, Christianity, and, uh, but it wasn't. As Pastor Paul was sharing a few moments ago, I was a terror, and I'll talk more about that in just a few minutes, but I uh, um, was baptized in the First Baptist Church of New Orleans, um, and um, no change was made. I got wet, but uh, beyond that, no one saw a change in my life. I still attended church. I did things, I went to the youth group or college group and did those kinds of things, but inwardly, there was no difference. And I could sense that. 
But I said, well, that's what Christianity is all about. I just have to do good things and good works, and uh, I'm all set. But the truth is, you on the outside looked like someone who was faithful. So you got your Ph.D., you went off to teach in Oklahoma. Tell us what began to happen as you were walking through your journey in your faith. Well, by the time I got to the University of Oklahoma, which was my second teaching position, um, I had probably done most of the things in the church that uh, someone who would be, quote, a good Christian would do. I taught uh, Sunday school class, uh, first to the youth and then uh, college students and young marrieds. Uh, I went on mission trips, domestically primarily. Um, was a deacon. I was a... Uh, a trainer in evangelism explosion, which is a witnessing uh, um, activity, and um, a bunch of other stuff. Went out on visitation, did all those things that, quote, a good uh, church member would so, do. So you weren't just a church member. I mean, you were checking the boxes. You were, you were doing everything that, like, as pastors and staff, we wish everybody would do. But still, something wasn't right. Continue. Well, again, I was, uh, there was no change internally. For me, and I knew intellectually, Scripture. You know, I as I went out on evangelism explosion uh, uh, with my teams, we would lead people to Jesus Christ, and uh, which was an interesting lesson I could talk about uh, other times. That the Word of God convicts people, not Jim Stock's great presentation of evangelism. Um, but it's again, like John nothing, Wesley, John Wesley preaching. Yeah. Uh, led people to Christ, but he, he wasn't saved. Right. And so um, uh, we were in uh, this church in Oklahoma, which was Southern Baptist Church, and um, I had just finished my little recording of my evangelism explosion that we had to do as our final step to get certified. And um, I asked my pastor, I said, uh, Pastor, I, I would really like to know the specific date that I got saved, just so I could put that in the uh, testimony. And he said, Jim, it, it, you don't need that. You know, if you know that there was a time and a place where you accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, that's all that's required. But if you want to know a date, seek God. And if he wants you to know that, he'll reveal it to you. So I started searching scripture. And so I went back and said, well, the, the logic I used based upon my education, was sort of a scientific method. I said, well, let me go back to important events in my life where I knew that God was there. And uh, let me search scripture to confirm that and maybe narrow down a date from, from that. And so I went to, to an event that occurred in 1978 where I had cancer, uh, very low survivability, uh, cancer at the time, um, and... Um, God showed me through his word, and I, I have my uh, uh, notes from my uh, Bible reading and, and prayer requests. He said, no, you weren't, very clearly. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to have to be baptized scripturally, because when I got in New Orleans, I was baptized, but I wasn't saved, so, so I got baptized. So I'm going to interrupt, because I'm going to share what happened. You were seeking God, make this clear, and... Really, God said, no, back then when you thought you were saved, you weren't saved. But your response was, oh, I guess I need to go through another ritual. I need to be yeah. baptized. So uh, I knew the requirements. You have to be saved in order to be baptized. Just immersion in water if you're uh, not. So I kept going through these events, and there were several. And he showed me clearly in his word that you weren't saved. You weren't saved then. You weren't saved then. I got to the last event, wasn't saved then. Now, it didn't take a Ph.D. for me to say, if I wasn't saved then, I'm not saved now, because nothing significant has happened since then. And then my question was, well, why? Because I knew intellectually what Scripture said, and I used it in my evangelism explosion presentations, uh, uh, and so I knew all the steps or stages but God was telling me I wasn't saved. I said, why not? Why was I not saved? And as Pastor Paul was mentioning, everybody in church would have said, ah, Jim Stock is the guy to emulate. Look all the stuff he does. And uh, we had a revival while I was uh, 
reading the scripture and finding this out. And um, I, the pastor who was preaching that, Bailey Smith, who was president of the Southern Baptist Convention, I guess one of his favorite uh, and most well-known sermons was the wheat and the tear parable. And uh, I got thinking about it. I said, yeah, I'm a tear, but what do I need to do to become a wheat? Intellectually, I knew what I had to do. But I said, God, why am I not? Why don't I have that saving faith that I talk to other people about? And he, he was very clear, and that's why I love God's word. He was very clear saying, it's pride. Certainly, Scripture talks a lot about pride. But pride goeth before a fall. And uh, I was going to be, one, if I hadn't seen that, I would have been one of those persons that one day in heaven, I'm standing there waiting to go in the entrance to heaven, and Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Because pride was separating me. Now, at that time, I wasn't an usher, which I did when I came here years ago, but I was usually about the second or third row of the uh, sanctuary, and uh, right in the front, um, and uh, I was about nine steps from the front, and I, find, I used that on one of my mission trips and preaching to a church in South Africa, so I got to use it later. Um, but during this revival meeting, the invitation was, was given, and as I was standing there, I said, am I going to walk up to the front? There's 600 people that are going to be looking at me and saying, why is he going up there? He does all this stuff. He's a good Christian example. And I, I walked up the nine steps to the associate pastor who was there, and he said, Jim, what do you need? I said, I need <laughs> to be saved. He said, what? I said, I'm lost. He says, you know what to do? Yeah, but it's pride that's keeping me from that. So I had to go up in front of those 600 people, all of whom thought I was a great Christian, and admit that I was lost. That was overcoming the pride. So, Dr. Stock, that's the day that you got born again. Is that right? That's the day I got born again. I got baptized the third time, but for <laughs> real. <laughs> We're so thankful. <laughs> We're so thankful that you were born again because God is using you. And as you know, in just a few moments, I'm going to give people in this room the opportunity to do what you did, to stand up and step out of a seat and to come here just as some did in the last service when we met together because some of you here need to be born again. And this is surprising to some folks, Dr. Stock, because when some people hear that phrase, we think of emotionalism, or you may think of a preacher that in communicating that is talking like this, if you don't turn, uh, you're going to burn. Uh, if, if you deny, you're going to fry. Uh, and, and you think that's, that's the kind of setting. Or you think it's just this ultra conservative and you associate it with kind of God and country or patriot. I mean, or I don't know, but the, the truth is these are the words of Jesus, and he says it's a necessity. I've got one more question, and then we're going to move on. Dr. Stock, how did things change after you were born again? I love your answer to this. <laughs> well, I made a comment to people. said, you know, it was much easier living the Christian life after I was saved. <laughs> Isn't that great? Before. So, you know, I got into Bible reading. I got into... Uh, having a prayer time and all of these other things, I certainly continued doing the things of evangelism and serving as a deacon and, and those things, but I actually saw results. I, I love Even your line. Even results. I love your line. It was a lot easier being a Christ follower when I was actually saved. Some of you, some of you, uh, there's a sin struggle, a habitual sin or something in your life, and it, it's like Paul's thorn in the, the side. It keeps coming after you, and you're thinking, man, I'm trying. I've done everything I can do, and it, it, I'm just telling you, when you're trusting in anything other than the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're trusting in self, and you need to be born again. Would you say thank you to Dr. Jim Stock? Thank you, Dr. Stock. Voice from Jesus saying, Depart from me, I never knew you. Amen. That's Amen. Gone. Hey, I want you to ask this question Do I need to be born again? I love Dr. Stock's story because what he said over and over again, I knew. You see, your spouse may not know, the person beside you, your coworker, your neighbor, they might not know, but I believe you know. 
And if you have any confusion, I believe God will clarify that in your life. Somebody will say, well, no, that's the devil that makes me doubt my salvation. Just think about that. How dumb would the devil have to be to make you doubt whether or not you're saved? Oh, come here, Brother Jim. Uh, now, you need to really think whether or not you need to take those nine steps and get saved so you can go to heaven. That's not the devil's strategy. He's a liar. He's a deceiver, but he's not going to make you doubt. If you're struggling with doubt today, if you're needing clarity, maybe that's the Holy Spirit of God saying you need to be born again. So let's continue. Verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Notice what he asked. How? He doesn't say why. And that's what some of you do when you come to the things of God. Rather than saying, God, well, what do I need? And why do I need it? You think about the how and it slows you down because you're afraid of what others will think. Or you were afraid of what you've done in your past. And, and the how paralyzes you. In Nicodemus's case, he was looking for information. And yet information is never what changes us. You can be a biblical scholar and spend eternity separated from God in hell. He thought he needed information, but what he needed was transformation. And what Jesus is saying is that there's no salvation in information that lacks transformation. And, and you may have been in a Bible drill. You, you may have uh, gone to Sunday school all your life. You may have walked down an aisle and been dumped in a water. And, and you may have been to confirmation or church class, but you've never been transformed. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. All the old things have passed away. All things have become new. It's not what you know. It's who you know. In fact, all my life I've been in church when my dad was the pastor and nearly 30 years as I've served in ministry and pastored. And I hear people, they get upset and they want to leave a church because it's not deep enough. And I don't know if I've ever seen anyone that literally is leaving because it's not deep enough. Usually there's something they disagreed with and that's okay. Maybe it was worth disagreeing with, but it's not because it's not deep enough. The, the truth is most of us don't need more educating. We are educated beyond our obedience. It's not the truth you know that changes you. It's the truth you apply. We need to apply the truth that God has given us. So let's continue. Verse 5, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So Jesus says, you want to know how? This is not from you. This is not something you do. It's from above. That word again can also be translated above. He's saying you need to be born from above. The way you're born from above is that it's not of anything you do. It's of God. God reaches down and changes you. Some of you have spent your life trying to change yourself. And you're nothing but frustrated because you can't do it. The only one who can change you is God. And so Jesus, one step ahead as he always is, says, let me see if I can explain this to you, Nick. You know that night breeze we feel right now? That wind that's blowing those long locks on your head? Where is that coming from? And Nicodemus is like, oh, I don't know. Right, you don't know where the wind comes from, but you sense it. You know it's there. And the same thing is what happens when God comes from above and changes you. So Nicodemus again says in verse 9, how can these things be? Maybe that's your problem today. You're caught up on the how. And Jesus is just saying, trust me. Jesus said, are you, notice this, he says, are you the teacher of Israel? So now we realize Nicodemus is not only a Pharisee, very religious. He, he's not only of that sect that makes him a ruler of the Pharisees. He's the teacher. I want you to think about someone who you would identify in our culture today as the Christian. Just get that person in your mind. Usually because of my lifetime and my influence, I think of Billy Graham. He was the Billy Graham of that day. He knew more about the things of God than anyone on the planet other than the one he was talking to, Jesus Christ himself. 
And Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand? What is he saying? You, you can be religious and not be regenerate. Are, are you an unsaved Christian? You identify yourself that way because mama told you to walk the aisle when you turned a certain age or because your family grew up in church or or because you're an American and somehow you've identified that with your patriotism? It's nonsense. You need to be born again. So then Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. He's describing what happens in church every Sunday all across the world. You come in and you hear the word of God. That's what Jesus says. You've heard the words, but you don't receive it. You walk out and you leave what's happened there like a crumpled bulletin on your seat. Nothing has changed. Jesus said, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how could you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one's ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. And then I think he kind of did like this and said, the son of man. And then he gets on Nicodemus' turf. He says, so, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. He, he talked with Nicodemus about something Nicodemus would understand, the Old Testament. If we had time, we would turn to Numbers 21. In Numbers chapter 21, you have this story that Jesus refers to. The children of Israel are once again complaining about Moses and to God. So they're complaining about their leader, and they're really complaining to God. And God did not like that then. And by the way, God does not like that now. And so God responds rather harshly. He sends poisonous snakes <laughs> that begin to bite the people. The next time you gossip about your pastor or your church, you need to pause and say, thank you, Jesus, for not sending a poisonous snake. But that's what he did. And so Moses, being tender-hearted, Moses began to pray to God. Oh, God, these are my family. This is my brothers and sisters. These are your children. Oh, God, spare them. Don't kill them all. And so God told Moses, okay, I, I want you to take and make a model of the very thing that has taken their life. Make a bronze snake serpent. And put it on a pole. And hold that pole up. And anybody that looks at that pole will be saved. It's in that context that Jesus then looks at Nicodemus and says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he's not believed in the name of the Son the only Son of God. You see, in the Old Testament story, the people who were bit by the snake and injected with the poison, they were going to die unless they looked at the serpent on the pole. And the truth is, Jesus was saying, Nic Nicodemus, you and everybody else even the most religious, even the church attenders on a Sunday morning, even those who are deacons and leaders and praise team members and technical workers, people on the cameras, everybody has been bitten and they're poisoned with sin and that sin is going to be punished by death and the only way to have life instead of that death is to not look to a serpent on a pole but to look to a Savior on a cross. That's the context of John 3.16. The most famous verse in the Bible. And I believe that passage speaks to questions that you may have today. 
So let me just give you three things that Jesus says about some of our faith questions. Number one, Jesus says, you must be born again. I want to be very clear. Christianity is an exclusive religion. You can't embrace what Christianity teaches and accept popular opinion today. Popular opinion today says we're all God's children. It says there's many paths to God. It says even if, if you're a good Muslim or if you're a good Buddhist or if you're a good whatever, you're probably going to end up in heaven. That is contrary to Scripture. Either what Jesus has said is true or it's not. If it's not true, then you're dumb for wasting your time believing part of it. If it is true, whoever you are, whatever you've done, you must be born again. If I want to be a good Muslim, you know what I have to do? If I want to be a good Muslim, I just follow the five pillars of Islam. There are things I have to do. If I want to be a good Buddhist, you know what I have to do? I follow the noble eightfold path. There are things I have to do. If I want to be a good Hindu, <laughs> I just have to figure out a way to please some of the millions of gods that there are. But if I want to be a Christian, I must be born again. The second thing Jesus speaks to, the second thing he answers is Nicodemus's how question. Jesus says it takes faith to be born again. Just as you don't see the wind, you're, you're, you're not going to understand all of this. Jesus gives us permission to have questions. He's not intimidated by your questions. And guess what? That's okay that you have questions. To some of the problems that we face is we try to put God in a box. We think we've got to get it all figured out. And the truth is, I am so grateful that my God is bigger than me, that He's a God of mystery. I embrace the mystery because I recognize that I can only understand it if I trust what I cannot see. I try not to use Greek words because I don't want you to think you need to know Greek to read the Bible. But in this case, there is some significance. The word that we've all of our lives translated believe is the word pastuo. And it means really to believe, yes, but to trust or to place your confidence in. So Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you have placed your confidence in all of these laws that you followed, all of this knowledge that you have, all of these things that you've done. But that's not going to get you where you need to be. Your confidence needs to be in me. Paul put it this way in Ephesians. He says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of works lest anyone should boast. And the truth is, some of you have been caught up in those works. If you were to be asked today, what is saving you? You would probably answer like, Lots of people throughout history. Well, I try to do my best. If, if you put the good things on one side and the bad things on the other side, I would hope the good would outweigh the bad and God would say, come on in. And, and yet, as you've heard today, that's not the answer. It doesn't matter how good you are. It's not good enough. It doesn't matter how many works you've done. You'll never do enough. And yet, some of you, you're turned off by the things of church because you've been at churches where the ones think that way and they walk around boasting because of all their works. And they're probably unregenerate, unsaved. Jesus says you must be born again. Jesus says it takes faith to be born again. And then Jesus says when you're born again, you live forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And though this is the most familiar verse in the Bible, I think it's been confusing. Because... All of us understand that we die. 
Most of us have lived enough to see someone we love die. And so we quote that verse and we say, yes, we got eternal life, but we don't understand it. And again, this is a little bit of a language thing. The, the truth is, these earliest followers of Jesus that understood this, these who had seen Jesus like Peter and Paul, they talked of death differently. Listen to Paul as he's talking to his young mentee, Timothy. He says in 2 Timothy 4, 6, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. He's not talking about leaving Timothy, he's talking about leaving this world, and he calls it a departure. Peter does the same thing in 2 Peter 1.15, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you'll be able at any time to recall these things. Departure. What does departure imply? I'm leaving one place, and I'm, I'm going to another place. It's not an end. It's just a, it's just a different context. It's a different setting. I think you understand that, right? Some of you are traveling. Aren't you grateful that we're out in the world again and can go to church and can go vacation and go all of these places? Some of you are going to go to TPA. That's the Tampa International Airport. And when you get to the Tampa International Airport, you're going to see two signs. One says arrival and one says death. Right? No, 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 no. Who would... Who would want to go to the airport and say, okay, come this way. This is the way to death. No, it, it says departure because that's a different meaning. And some of you just had an aha moment. What you get through Jesus is you get to live forever with him. So what do you get if you don't have Jesus? Jesus calls it perishing. Elsewhere in the Bible, it's called eternal death. Eternal death. If you're a Christ follower, you do not have to fear death. But none of us look forward to dying. Next week, I'll celebrate the second Father's Day that my dad's changed his destination. That he's in heaven. You know, after his death, man, we celebrated his life. We didn't have to worry about him anymore. But the nine months prior, I'll be honest, it was kind of like hell on earth. We watched him die. And the Bible says a life without Jesus is eternal or forever dying. I believe in a place that's a literal hell. It's a place of fire, the Bible describes. But even if you don't want to think about it that way, just think about your worst fears of dying. Most of us pray that we would die in our sleep, right? Forever dying. What do you have to do to experience forever dying? Not a thing. Jesus said in that passage, he said, I didn't come to condemn you because you're condemned already. Did you catch that? Why are we condemned already? Because it's not what we do. It's who we are. It's not all these sinful acts that you, you do in your life. It's the nature with which you live. And that nature, that sin in your life, unless it's dealt with, unless you're born from above, unless you're born again, unless there's a moment where the Spirit of God transformed you, it's that nature that will change you into an eternal death. But what do you do to have to experience that life? You just got to look to Jesus. Jesus was saying God gives us a love that cannot be exceeded so that he might give us a life that will not be exhausted so that we might have a light that cannot be extinguished. That's who our God is. You have to be born again to experience eternal life. So I ask you today, have you been born again? If I were to ask you your birth date, unless you have a memory issue, you probably would know that. Do you remember the time that you were spiritually born? As Dr. Stock said, if it's not a date, 
I don't remember the date. I remember where I was and how old I was. Do you remember? Can you go back to that moment? If you can't, why not nail that down today? So before we pray, let me just tell you, this isn't a question of your ancestry. You're not born again because mama took you to church. It's not a question of your accomplishments. You're not born again because you're a deacon, a leader, a teacher, or a pew sitter. It's a question of your acceptance. Have you accepted who you are and the need you have for Jesus? You're not born again because something you've been told about. A lot of people I talk to, well, mama told me I walked down the aisle when I was eight years old. Well, tell me about it. Well, I don't remember anything. I know they dumped me in the water, but it's not something you've been told about. Being born again is not what you've been taught. It's not just knowing facts. It's about transformation. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? I want everyone in the room just to stand to your feet. I want you to look this way. In just a moment, I'm going to ask us to bow our heads in prayer. And then I'm going to pray for you. I believe with all my heart there are teenagers and college students in this room that need to be born again. I believe there are young adults that need to be born again. I believe there are parents my age that have children who are active in church, but as they listen to the Word of God today, realize I'm not saved. I need to be born again. I believe there are senior adults who've served, just like Dr. Stock said, some of you longer than I'm alive, but you need to be born again. You may be on our technical team and you need to leave your position of service and be born again. In just a moment after I pray, we're going to sing that old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It's like looking to that serpent on the pole, except we're looking to a Savior on a cross. And if you need to be saved, I'm going to ask that just as we begin to sing, you step out of your seat and you just come and stand and face me right here at the front. Would you bow your heads with me? Our pastors are coming. They're standing here even right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, you know all week we've prayed for this moment. You know, just before I walked on this stage, I begged you that people would be born again in this service just as they were in the last service. Lord, you know that men and women gathered on yesterday morning and we touched these chairs and we prayed for the people that were sitting there. And we prayed that the people who would be in those seats would be born again today. So God, I pray that you answer those prayers for your glory in the name of Jesus.